Everybody, welcome and thanks so much for joining us today. I don't know what the weather is like in other parts of the world, but it's a beautiful grey day here in Ireland. So anything to lift the spirits is always fantastic. Um, delight to see some faces I know and some new faces as well. So for any of you that haven't joined us before, um, I'm Rose Barrett. I'm one of the co-founders of Grow Moat and community manager now. So Grow Moat is an Irish nonprofit and we're all about making remote work local. And we do that in a number of ways. And if you want to find out more about that, come ask us. We are so delighted to have John Coughlin from GitLab with us today. John is going to give us some fantastic insights into remote working. And if you haven't before come across GitLab, they are one of the most amazing companies to check out. They're the first fully remote company. They, their, their knowledge is, I can't even say enough of how fantastic their knowledge is. And they've been so open, transparent and generous with sharing that knowledge with the rest of the world. Um, so without further ado, John, over to you. Thanks, Rose. Um, really excited to be here with you all today. Um, I have some Irish heritage, and so it's cool to hear Rose pronounce my last name. She does it with this really cool kind of like accent on the GH. Um, but you don't hear it. Actually. Well, we say Coglin in the US, but you have oh, that Oh, little... yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> So it's cool to hear the uh, proper pronunciation. Um, and thank you all for being here today. I appreciate everybody taking time to come and chat with remote work about me. Um, I'll share just a little bit of my background. So I live in New York. I've been working at GitLab for about two years. Prior to that, I was running a co-working space in Brooklyn. It was one of the first co-working space in Brooklyn and then um, transitioned into technical kind of evangelism uh, for a few different companies based in New York. And then when the opportunity uh, to join GitLab presented itself, um, I was really excited because uh, I'm really interested in remote work or I was really interested in remote work um, before joining GitLab and, and that kind of interest and passion has only grown. Um, and it, I think that's partially because, you know, what I'm really excited about um, just in like professional life is helping people find kind of happiness at work and creating inclusive um, organizations. That was something I tried to do when I was uh, running a co-working space and it's kind of been a thread, um, you know, over the last 10 years or so in my career. And so, you know, being an evangelist at GitLab, I'm not just evangelizing our product. Um, I'm also evangelizing our style of work and um, how we work and, and our culture and our values. Um, and so it's, it's a great fit for me and, you know, this kind of, you know, session today fits really nicely uh, with that mission of mine. So really excited to chat with you all today. Been at GitLab for about two years. So I feel like, at, you know, at this point, I'm like a remote work veteran. I feel like most of the world is starting to catch up uh, much faster now um, because of, of COVID and all of the related kind of restrictions on, on where and when and how people are allowed to work. Um, and so I think a lot of people have been thrown into remote work and, and that itself has presented some challenges. And I think in some ways has actually hurt um, the kind of perception of remote work because remote working during a pandemic um, is quite different than, than just remote work uh, you know, during normal times. But we can talk about that in, in a little bit. You know, I think, why was I interested in remote work? Partially because you know, I'm a surfer. And uh, yeah, if you believe that or not, there's actually some good surfing in New York, but not quite as good as Ireland. And this is something Rose and I spoke about. Um, Ireland's got some famous uh, surfing beaches and I'm hoping when travel bans are restricted, I can visit and, and get some waves over there with you all. Um, but yeah, so, so as a surfer, I just wanted to be kind of closer to you know, the ocean and be available to kind of adjust my schedule to the rhythms of the ocean. Um, and so that was one of the reasons. The other reason is that you know, you probably know this or, or maybe not, but New York is kind of notorious for terrible commutes with traffic and awful public transportation. Uh, and so the opportunity to avoid having that as part of my daily routine um, was something that was pretty exciting to me. So I think today I'm going to, you know, kind of go through a few different facets of, of, of remote work, how it benefits organizations, um, what are the keys for organizational success, what are the keys for individual success? And, and then what are some of the best practices around remote that you can apply to your communities? Um, and this is probably most interesting to folks like Rose or other folks that are kind of uh, leading communities. But I really do want this to kind of be as interactive as possible. So um, I'll pause, you know, as I'm uh, speaking to, to get folks um, 
hopefully asking questions. Um, I also didn't prepare any slides. Um, one of the things that's unique about GitLab is that we have um, a very transparent company. Um, so all of our documentation on, on how we run our company is public. It's available on our handbook. Uh, all of our you know, roadmap and things that we're working on in our product uh, is publicly available for folks to view and comment on and contribute to um, through our issue boards where we build our product. Um, and folks can even contribute code if they, you know, are, are so inclined to, you know, take an issue and, and address whatever kind of, you know, um, technical changes need to be made in those issues. Uh, and we also record and post our meetings to YouTube. So you can go and watch, you know, my team meetings or the meetings that I have with community members. Um, we try to be really transparent and, um, and I think, you know, what we're doing is pretty groundbreaking. So uh, I'm always excited to share it. And so that's why I'll rely on the handbook um, mostly today rather than slides. Um, but before I get started, does anybody have any questions they'd like to, to ask? Any burning questions um, that you were itching to ask when, before today's meeting started? Is everybody in consumption um, mindset at the moment with lunchtime in Ireland? That's fun. Um, yeah, so just thinking about like the benefits for GitLab and, and how GitLab became remote. So, you know, there was no intention for GitLab to be a remote company. Um, the, the story is that we had an office and people stopped showing up. Um, and that's why we became a remote company. Um, and this was when the company was quite okay. small. So, there was only so. um, I think I heard someone, does someone want to ask a question? Frank wasn't muted, I just muted him oh, there. Okay. Um, so, so we had an office, you know, and, and there was about 10, 10 team members working out of there and then kind of slowly one by one, they all stopped showing up and they, did, they realized that they didn't need the office space anymore. Uh, and so they started pursuing this all remote um, model, but you know, despite there not being some kind of you know really key insight behind uh, adopting the all remote model, there were definitely benefits to it for GitLab. Um, one is diversity. So when you're a re remote company, you can hire from all over the world, um, and there's lots of benefits to that. One is that you get this diverse workforce, um, but you're also able to kind of pull top talent from. Um, every part of the world. So instead of pulling from a kind of local pool of talent um, that's, you know, geographically, you know, in some kind of radius near your office, you're able to recruit the best people from around the world. Um, and that, you know, is really exciting too. And, and then, you know, at GitLab, we pay local rates. So our compensation is tied to a location factor based on the cost of living in an area. And that provides, um, you know, the ability for us to you know, hire kind of more effectively uh, for the different roles on our team. Um, rather than, you know, if you're paying kind of, you have an office in San Francisco, you're paying all these people kind of um, at San Francisco rates, you're not able to be as efficient um, or grow your team as quickly as you would if you're paying local rates. There's also, you know, productivity benefits to working remotely. Um, there's lots of studies that prove that people are more effective and more productive when working from home um, or working from, you know, as an individual in, in a co-working space or something like that. Um, in addition to the savings around salary, there's also you know associated savings um, in not having to pay for office space uh, and other things, which also just allows you to continue reinvesting um, in things that really help the business grow. Um, and you know, as we kind of have moved through the last few years, there's more and more of an expectation from employees to be able to work remotely. And so, in order to compete, you know, for top talent you know, either, you know, in a local market or at a global scale, um, I think there's going to be, especially after COVID, uh, an expectation from the people that are joining your team that they'll be able to work remotely. And so we want to be as competitive as possible. Um, any, any questions? Questions in the chat there, John. Um, Stuart was asking, He's interested about managing teams who are all remote, but then also uh, teams who are hybrid and any advice or tips. Okay. Yeah, I think um, that's a great question and something that we talk about at GitLab a lot. I think, you know, to start with managing teams who are working remotely, 
you know, there's a few practices that I think are really um, important to be a successful manager at a, you know, of a team um, that's all remote. I think, you know, transparency becomes really important. And so being able to kind of document everything in meetings. Um, so that's one of the things that we do at GitLab. In every meeting we have a shared Google doc where we document the agenda, all of the points that people are making. Um, we try to keep track of, you know, basically every comment that's made in the meeting in a document. Um, and we also record our meetings, as I mentioned earlier. And why that's important is because when you're managing a remote team, there's, you know, you don't want to have the expectation that everybody needs to be at every meeting at the same time. You want to allow for teams to work asynchronously. And by documenting things and recording meetings, people who may be in a different time zone or maybe have a, you know, commitment to take care of their child during your team's um, assigned meeting time, those folks will be able to, you know, have the same access to information as the other team members who are able to attend that synchronous meeting. Um, so I think that, you know, being kind of a champion for asynchronous communication on your team um, is really huge and, and, and really important, especially when your team is distributed across multiple time zones. Um, I think, you know, having a clear set of values, um, you know, is really important. So at GitLab, we have our company values, their credit, it's an acronym for collaboration, results, efficiency, diversity, inclusion, and belonging, iteration, and transparency. Um, but I think each team also has also has to have their own set of values, or maybe their kind of sub values of the the bigger company values. But I think having those values and allowing um, your team members autonomy to make decision within the context of those values um, is important because it allows people to be efficient, be managers of one, make decisions, and and kind of get work done without asking for approvals. Um, which I think is another thing um, that's worked really well for us, um, you know, at GitLab. So I could go on, um, you know, on that point for a while, but I want to also address your second question um, around, you know, kind of this, you know, remote office split or what we call, you know, hybrid. Um, at GitLab, we have a pretty strong stance against hybrid remote. Um, now, I think the case that you're, kind of referring to with two days in the office and three days out, if everyone on the team is, you know, operating on that same schedule where they're in the office on the same days and out of the office on the same days, I think that's less problematic. I think what creates serious concerns for us is when you have either team members that are in the office every day and then team members that are out of the office every day or people on different schedules um, being in the office. Um, and I know that some of that, you know, right now is a result of COVID and the number of people that can be in an office where, you know, my neighbors works at Goldman Sachs and he's in the office two days a week on Monday and Tuesday. And then there's other people, you know, from his team that are in the office Thursday and Friday. And, you know, where that creates problems is that then you start getting this information asymmetry, um, which is kind of what I was referring to in my last point around the importance of documentation. When you have people working different schedules and spending time together um, at different cadences, you start to you know, lose that consistency of information. And at some point, some people will start to feel like they don't have all the information that they need to be you know, kind of a full member of the team. So if, you know, as an example, you're the manager and you have four direct reports and only two of them are in the office with you. And then the other two are in the, the, the part of the week where you're working from home, um, that's gonna create some kind of tension, I think, within your team where not everyone's gonna have the same information. They're not gonna have the same access to you. You know, Maybe you're running out to get coffees um, with your team members on the days when you're in the office and those casual conversations actually um, you know, can wind up being really important for people from you know, relationship building, professional development, um, or even just access to the information that they need to be successful in their jobs. So um, where we stand at GitLab is that you know, it's really important to keep a level playing field. And you know, because we're all remote, we champion you know, the all remote, everyone's remote all the time um, as the, the kind of best model. Um, but I do think, you know, if you're going with this kind of hybrid model, um, having everyone on a team on the same cadence um, so that they're in the office together and out of the office together is probably the least problematic approach um, to solving that kind of hybrid problem or hybrid schedule. 
That's great, John. And, and really for us here in Ireland, it's looking like the majority will be hybrid. And what we have said is it is the most challenging version of remote. So we're going to have to work together to make sure that that's done well. And um, Vicky just asks, um, she's keen to talk about the location of the staff and do you have many based out of Ireland? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, thanks, Vicky. So as I said, you know, at GitLab, we're very um, transparent. And so I'm just going to share my screen quickly. So if you visit our team page, um, you'll be able to see a list of all of the folks on GitLab's team with a bio and links to their social profiles and their GitLab profile. Um, and we also have this really cool map at the top where you can see uh, where folks are located around the world. And um, you know, as you zoom in, you can get more details. So you can see where in Ireland um, our team members are located. And so we do have lots of folks um, on our team that are located in Ireland and, and across Europe, as you can see. Um, I, I think the most folks are kind of concentrated in the Dublin and uh, Cork areas. Um, so um, you can kind of dig in and, and see, um, you know, who those folks are and, and what their roles are. Uh, but I do know it's a diverse kind of um, population. We have folks on people ops, we have sales folks, we have um, operations folks like doing, you know, kind of back office accounting and things like that. Um, and uh, also folks on the marketing team, which is my team. Um, so lots of different um, folks from lots of different roles, uh, lots of different places in Ireland. So it's really cool. Just, this is like a micro example of that diversity that we were talking about earlier and um, how that opportunity, how remote work unlocks um, really interesting opportunities for folks um, around the world. I agree. I like the fact that um, Vicky's just said you've mentioned pets as well. So uh, that's, that's nice to see really brings the human element in. And and then I'll, I see the next question from John Atkinson. So um, we, up until very recently, we have been fully transparent um, about our salaries. Um, there was an issue that I can't really talk about um, with one uh, with someone who, were, who was kind of helping us with data for that um, compensation calculator. And so we no longer are publishing that publicly. Um, but we do share it with people as soon as they're in the interview process. Um, so, so that's kind of how we're addressing that. But for years, um, we were really, you know, shared every, you know, kind of a, a range of salary uh, for every role in the company. Um, how do we stop people from being taken away by higher offers? You know, I don't think that there's, you know, a real solution for that. I think what we think about is by paying local rates, um, you know, we're able to be competitive with the companies that will be competing for that talent. Um, we also, you know, provide employees ownership in the company through stock options um, right now. And if you've, you know, followed the GitLab kind of um, trajectory and fundraising news, like those have been, um, you know, another way where we've been able to compensate people um, really competitively beyond their base salary. Um, and there's a, just this total rewards kind of um, mindset that we have where when you kind of include the salary, these options, which, you know, there's no guarantee that they'll continue on this trajectory, but, you know, have been increasing in value uh, for folks that have joined the team over the last few years. Um, and then the benefits that we provide in local markets uh, through healthcare, through our, you know, generous kind of time off and just the value of being part of our remote work culture and the families and friends days that we offer people. There's so many different ways that we kind of uh, reward our, our people. Um, you know, I think when you, when you add those up, I think GitLab's really competitive from a compensation perspective. Um, yeah, and then, you know, from a pricing, you know, perspective against, you know, competitors, I, I, you know, I'm not in sales, so I don't have a ton of visibility into that, but I know that we're constantly kind of thinking about our pricing and, um, I think what sets us apart is that at GitLab, we have a monthly release cycle. So we release a new version of GitLab every month on the 22nd. And so at the rate that we're adding features, we're constantly adding new value to the product. So um, even if our competitors are, you know, maybe able to undercut us on pricing that we're going to still beat them on value um, because we're always adding new features and functionality. And I, I think there's lots of advantages to our product against the competition that um, when you think about the total cost of ownership, um, it, you know, and the value that you get from that GitLab can be, you know, it's hard to beat, um, I would say. 
So I'm just going to keep scrolling through the chat. I'm so excited that people ask questions. What would be cool yeah, is if thank you folks everyone. want to um, verbalize them. Yeah, so, so Vicky's just asked there about remote working. She said, well, remote working comes flexible working. How do you manage this? And do you have core hours? Um, yeah, so Vicky, that, there's actually a page. I was going to show this in the handbook if like we didn't have questions. Um, but we definitely do not have core working hours. I would say commonly the, the most popular time for meetings tends to be, you know, for me, um, between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, that's when most of Europe and most of the U.S. are on um, at the same time. Uh, but, you know, I think for different teams and for different roles, um, folks tend to work, you know, the hours that they uh, that are best for their team and for their role. So if you're, you know, an engineering person and most of your work is done independently, um, they may not, you know, need to kind of have this synchronous uh, time with their teammates. Uh, for us in marketing, we, we do tend to have, you know, more meetings um, where we get together and, and talk through ideas. And so um, we, I tend to be a little bit busier during those middle of the day hours. Um, but in our handbook, we have this really cool page about a nonlinear workday. Um, and this is something that I kind of live by where I'll wake up and do a lot of work, like right when I wake up in the morning, um, like normally right after I get my kids their cereal, um, I'll start working and then um, I'll take a little bit of a break, you know, kind of late morning before I get into that heavy meeting period. So, you know, probably shortly after this wraps up, I'll take a break for like an hour, um, go through my heavy meeting period, do a, you know, another break for lunch. Um, and then I normally try to, you know, wrap things up between four and five Eastern time. And that's when my son is coming home from school and we'll hang out through dinner. And then after dinner, maybe I'll log back on for like a half an hour and just see if anybody on the West coast, you know, needs anything from me before I call it a day. And so, you know, kind of breaking the day into smaller digestible chunks is, um, something I like to do. Um, and something I think a lot of our team members embrace, um, at GitLab. Great question from John Atkinson. Um, how many hours do you spend reading all the mi minutes of the meetings or how do you filter what to read? Yeah, I think for me, I can consume the minutes. Like the minutes are much easier to consume than a, a meeting. And so in general, like if I, there's a synchronous meeting that I can attend, I try to be there and that way I can add value to that meeting and contribute in real time. Um, but for like some of the bigger team meetings or if there's some kind of like preparation meeting for a conference that we're sponsoring where I'll be staffing it. Um, in those cases, I tend to rely on the minutes or watch the YouTube videos at 2x speed um, because instead of being in a 30 minute meeting, I can I can get it done in 15 um, when I'm watching at two times speed. So um, those are some of the hacks that I do to kind of be as productive as possible um, with meetings where I'm less of a active participant and more of a consumer. That 2x um, thing I do with a lot of talks and stuff. It's um it's really handy to get through information. But yeah, I would say I probably spend about an hour a week on on just getting caught up on meetings I wasn't able to attend. That's amazing that you don't need to be there as well to to be still be informed. And Kieran asks, body language and nonverbal communication can be picked up when people are co-located. How can managers pick up on what a remote employee is not telling you? That's hard. I think um, every employee is different. I think a lot of times, you know, there's some subtle body language things that happen in Zoom. Um, so one, we ask people to keep their cameras on whenever they can. Um, and so we can actually see, you know, people's reaction if they're rolling their eyes or throwing their head back or, um, you know, another tell on, on Zoom is when you're, you know, unmuting. So if you see someone unmute, you know that they want to say something. And so a lot of times, you know, if there's a team meeting, I'll, and I see someone come off mute, but they don't say anything else. I, you know, so and so was there something you wanted to add there? Um, but yeah, you know, those are kind of the, you know, the little tells. Um, I think it's harder when you're not able to see someone all day and kind of through their workflow, you're not going to catch up on on every single thing. Um, I think, you know, sometimes a private message in Slack, um, you know, just kind of feeling people out um, is another kind of way to keep the line of communication open. Um, you know, not everyone is a verbal communicator. Some people are more comfortable, you know, having conversations in chat. Even my wife is like that sometimes. Like when we get in a big fight, she always sends me a long text message after explaining how she feels instead of saying it to me. Um, so I'm used to that type of communication. 
Um, and so just being adapt, being able to adapt yourself to the communication styles of your team, um, I think is really key. Um, and, and you have to kind of figure that out on a person by person basis, but once you do, um, you know, modeling your behavior after what works for them is, is probably the best approach. It's been really interesting for us as well, because um, we've had so many organizations have to suddenly go remote this year that wouldn't necessarily have had the chance to put everything in place that GitLab has been able to over the years. So it's really, really challenging. I do find it interesting when some people say to me that's not possible, but obviously GitLab is an exact example of how possible all of this is. Stuart is asking, how do you do performance management in a more formal sense, as in personal development plans? Yeah, so we actually just changed our performance um, review model. So we had an, a model that we had been kind of using and we've moved to like a nine box model. I'm not sure if folks are familiar with that. Um, and I don't think we're adopt we're using a different term for that at GitLab, but it's essentially based on this nine box model where you have this kind of metric of like performance and potential and you rank people in the in the this grid based on their perceived performance and, and potential. Um, you know, for personal development plans, we also do kind of career um, growth conversations on a quarterly basis. So I do weekly one-on-ones with everyone on my team. And once a quarter, we'll um, review their career kind of development plan and what their goals are and, and set a plan for the quarter on how they want to work towards achieving those goals. And for some people, it might be know, raising up a level for some people it might be getting exposure in a different area of the organization or the different part of the business because they're thinking about maybe making a move into sales or something like that. Uh, for some people, it may be, you know, taking on a leadership position, managing a team. Um, and so we'll look for opportunities to get folks into situations or, you know, working on projects where they can take a lead um, of that project and, and kind of be the DRI and coordinating with multiple departments. So, um, those would be the ways that we're kind of, um, you know, like formally doing all of that. And um, I can share, I, I'm not going to Google it right now because we're almost out of time, um, but I can share like links to our handbook so you can go in and, and read exactly, uh, you know, how we do that. And there should be links to Google Doc templates that you can use for those career development conversations and um, a lot more detail on the nine box and how we use that. I hadn't come across that model before. Um, I just shared a link into the chat, but yeah, whatever links you share, John, I'll make sure to um, to share out to uh, to the to the attendees. Okay. And Aidan's just saying that his role in IBM was professional development manager, and he ran it remotely, so it's possible. Yeah, it is. It's work, though. I mean, let's be honest; there is work involved. But that's amazing. Does anybody else have any questions before we tie up? John, could I ask you a question there? Sure. I'm just wondering, uh, for you personally, what would you find is most challenging in uh, communication managing your team? Um, like, what I is mean, something that you would want support with yourself, maybe? Uh, honestly, I'm, I'm pretty new to managing a team. Um, and so I think what I would like is more transparent feedback from my team members on how I can do a better job, um, which is probably a hard thing to ask them to do because I don't know how many, you know, folks are comfortable being critical of, of their teammates. Um, but I think that would be, you know, the biggest thing for me is just really detailed, transparent feedback on how I could do a better job as a manager from both the people that are on my team and then also the director who I report to. Um, I think that would be something that I would really like. And that's not really, you know, exclusive to a remote work environment. I think that getting constructive feedback is really important to being successful and whether it's, you know, in person or remote. Um, for remote, you know, specific to remote, um, what I would like, you know, as, as a manager, I think um, I wish I could spend more time you know, with my team members, I try to be really respectful of their calendars. And so we do one team meeting a week and then one-on-ones every week. Um, but selfishly, I would love to, you know, have 30 minutes with everybody every day. So we could have more of that, you know, kind of casual conversation and, um, you know, going back to that body language kind of question earlier, I think um, just the more you're communicating with someone, the better you can kind of get to know them and, and understand them. But um 
but yeah, that's probably the, the one change I would make that's more within my control. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. I think um, it is something valuable to get feedback, but it's probably sensitive for people to get feedback or to give feedback to their manager. So yeah, what would be some, some way to ask for that maybe? Yeah, we did like, so we do a 360 review at GitLab where we ask, you know, we get to pick basically a, a group of people. And I think they recommend like four to six uh, people to give you feedback. Unfortunately, like most, almost 99% of the feedback that you get is all positive feedback. I was like, I actually- Maybe gave there's people, only positives. <laughs> I gave people like a balance, basically. I gave people like, these are the things that I think you're doing great. And I would do like five of those. And then I would do like one thing that you could improve. I felt so bad afterwards because everybody just gave me the good stuff and no one told me like where I could do better. I'm like, oh, am I a jerk for doing that? Um, but yeah, I think it's hard. You know, I should probably come up. I mean, maybe there's like a virtual kind of like feedback box, like an anonymous feedback box. But I don't think that fits with our transparency value. Like part of the transparency yeah. value is kind of, you know, having difficult conversations and, you know, me as a manager or me as a teammate being like, I'm confident enough in myself that I can take that, you know, feedback from you directly. And, and those people can tell me how they really feel. Cause that's really what transparency is about. It's not about, you know, this kind of sharing information in a, in a black box secretively. It's about being honest with each other. I love that. Um, and I think it's such a gift to, to get all of the feedback because how can any of us improve if we don't know on the areas that we're weaker um, just as we tie up, Stuart was just wondering how many are on your team, John? Yeah, so I have three people on my team and an open spot. So um, we're hiring someone to serve as our evangelist program manager. I think Rose knows about this role. Um, but it's a uh, role where you'd be managing our meetups program. So we have 57 meetups groups across 30 countries with local organizers in each community. Um, and we need someone to kind of lead that program. And they would also... Uh, manage the GitLab Heroes program, which is a champions program of about 90 people in our community who are actively contributing either through organizing meetups, contributing code, doing tech talks, writing blog posts, responding to folks on our forum, or, or just other folks that are really visible in the GitLab community. And so we provide them with support and rewards as well. Um, and so we're looking for someone to fill that role. Um, that was my role prior to taking over the team. Actually, John, could you speak, just as you finish up, could you speak a little bit to how you're changing your um, hiring process and referral process? Um, I'm not sure. Oh, about the talent community? Yes, the talent community, sorry. Yeah, so, yeah. so one thing that we've done at GitLab to kind of be more true to our diversity, inclusion, and belonging value is um, we've shifted from like an inbound to an outbound recruiting model. So um, we have all of the open roles on our site listed and folks can, um, you know, still send us their resume and LinkedIn and things, but we um, are actively sourcing also for all of those roles. So we have our recruiting team looking for candidates that will improve the diversity, um, inclusion and belonging in our, on our team and bring in folks from different geographic areas or different, um, you know, professional backgrounds um, or different other kind of facets of diversity. Um, and so that's been a shift that we made since the beginning of, um, of COVID because our, you know, I think our um, hiring plans are, were reduced a little bit. Um, and so that's been an, an interesting shift for us, um, just being really thoughtful about who we invite to be in the interview process um, and being really proactive in reaching out to people that we think are a good fit. It's been so interesting to see yourselves and other companies changing how you're bringing candidates in. Um, and we're hearing more and more the term, uh, the future of, of hiring is community. So we're quite excited about that. Um, John, thank you so very much for taking the time to join us today. Is there anything else you'd like everybody to know before you leave? And by the way, when you do get a chance to come to Ireland, we'll all be really excited to host you. So you yourself and your good lady wife will have plenty of places to go. All right, cool. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, the one thing I would leave everyone with, you know, is, you know, just a little bit about GitLab. Um, GitLab is an open source, um, open core uh, product for DevOps. Um, we're a single application for the entire DevOps lifecycle. So if you have 
um, you know, if you're an engineer or you work in um, technology, I'd love for you to check out uh, GitLab and see if it's a fit for your team. But um, other than that, you know, really excited to be able to spend some time with you all today. Thank you so much for the questions. Um, and and um, yeah, thank you, Rose, for the invite. So great seeing you all. And I hope to be part of this community again in the future, either in person, virtual, whatever. Um, really cool group. So thanks. Awesome. Thanks, John. And thanks, everybody. And we'll talk to you during the week, hopefully. Have a great week, all. Okay. Take Thank care. you very much. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks, Thank Joe. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank